Right, in this lecture we're going to talk about the conservation of angular momentum, but before we do that uh, I mentioned uh, a question that I ask students is to derive the differential equations of motion for a three-dimensional continuous body. And we took a little bit of a detour to show a couple things, but let me go right through that and then we'll, we'll talk about the conservation of angular momentum. So again, the conservation of linear momentum is effectively the summation of forces is equal to ma applied to a three-dimensional continuous body subjected to body forces, accelerations, and surface tractions. We can first write this on the left-hand side is a volume integral of the density times the body force integrated over the volume plus a surface integral of the traction as a function of the normal integrated over the surface being equal to the density times the acceleration over the volume. If we rewrite this in terms of components we have the I body force term. Now these will actually be a set of uh, three equations a traction vector component or the surface and the acceleration term using our relationship between the traction vector components and the stress tensor we can write this as sigma i j n j and using the divergence theorem we can rewrite that surface integral in terms of a volume integral just a partial derivative of sigma i j now that we have all three of these <clears throat> in terms of volume integrals we can group them all together I'm going to lead off with this term these body force terms this vector is a force per mass and then we have minus rho ai here since we have an arbitrary volume of integration, the integrand has to be zero, and thus leading us to the differential equations of motion. So without that detour, it goes pretty quick. The equilibrium equations then would be when the acceleration terms are equal to zero and in certain cases will also neglect body forces. All right, so let me save that slide and then with that same figure we're going to take a look at the conservation of angular momentum. And so for the conservation of angular momentum it <clears throat> starts out in a very similar way. Now we're going to have a position vector we're going to take the angular momentum about some arbitrary point. So our coordinate system may be over here somewhere. And the position vector to that little volume element, we call that position vector x. So to formulate the conservation of angular momentum is pretty straightforward. We're just going to take x cross product with each of those three vectors that we have in the previous line for the conservation of linear momentum. So a volume integral. Now the row is a scalar, but it's going to be the position vector x cross product b it's going to be the position vector x cross product the traction term and lastly it's going to be the position vector x crossed with 
the acceleration term. Now very early on we talked about how to write a cross product in terms of a permutation tensor. So for any particular coordinate system x1, x2, x3 that we have here, we're going to be able to write this in terms of components. I need a little bit of space. Put the first term as rho epsilon i j k x j b k second term epsilon i j k x j now we know how to write this in terms of the stress tensor we need another index. We're going to use KL NL. That's over the surface. And then we have rho epsilon i j k x j a k d v. Again, we need to convert the surface integral to a volume integral by the use of the divergence theorem. And so this surface integral term, I'm pulling the epsilon ijk out of it for right now. That surface integral term, xj sigma kl nl over the surface, can be rewritten as a volume integral of the quantity xj sigma kl, that quantity, the partial derivative with respect to l, over the volume. All right, let me save this page and make a little bit of room. Right. Now, again, working with the term without the permutation tensor in it. What we have is a product, and we're taking the partial derivative with respect to x sub l of this product, x sub j sigma kl. Let's go ahead and write that out long ways. So it's the partial derivative of x j sigma kl with respect to x l. which is a product rule that we have to do. We have the partial derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the partial derivative of the second. I'm going to use the comma notation here on this term. Now, We've seen this before. That's our Kronecker delta. That would be a Kronecker delta JL and Kronecker delta acting as a replacement operator on the indices. This would give us a sigma JL. Uh, oh, sorry, it would give us a sigma kj. The L is the one that's in common. Alright. And so if we go back up to the top equation, we can factor out a permutation tensor from each of the three terms out from everything. We can have a x sub j factored out from three of the terms. The three terms are rho b sub k plus sigma kl come l minus rho a sub k. Then we have a plus kj 
integrate over the volume is equal to zero. Now, if we recall, our equilibrium equations were of the form sigma i j comma j plus rho b sub i minus rho a sub i is equal to zero. So the statement in the parentheses is really just a statement of the equilibrium or the differential equations of motion. And that itself is equal to zero. So this entire term right here will be equal to zero. And so we can reduce this integral down quite a lot. We have a volume integral then of the permutation tensor epsilon j k epsilon i j k sigma k j dv is equal to zero. Again with an arbitrary volume of integration we have epsilon i j k sigma k j equal to zero. Now let's take a look at this. We have two repeated indices. Okay, so we have a double summation. Let's expand this term out. I is a free index. We need to leave it as I. But we would have epsilon I11 one one, sigma K1 and so forth. Anything when we have a repeated index and permutation tensor is zero. So we really only need to focus on the ones where we have unique I, J, and K where j and k are different from each other. So one of the terms we can look at is epsilon i 1 2 sigma 1 2 epsilon i 1 3 sigma 1 3 epsilon i 2 3 sigma 2 3 epsilon i 3 2 sigma 3 2 epsilon i 2 1 sigma 2 1 and the last one epsilon i 3 1 sigma 3 1 and then that's all equal to zero. Again i is a free index if we choose i to be 1, well then a couple of these terms will drop out. If we choose i is equal to 2, a couple of different terms will drop out and so forth. Let's look at the first one. Let's take i is equal to 1. We'll go ahead and do this long ways. But we'd have epsilon 1, 1, 2, sigma 1, 2. Epsilon 1, 1, 3, sigma 1, 3. Epsilon 1, 2, 3, sigma 2, 3. Epsilon 1, 3, 2, sigma 3, 2, epsilon 1, 2, 1, sigma 2, 1, epsilon 1, 3, 1, sigma 3, 1. Well, that term is 0, this term is 0, this term is 0, and that term is 0 by the properties of the permutation tensor. So that's going to leave us with epsilon 1, 2, 3, sigma 2, 3, plus epsilon 1, 3, 2, sigma 3, 2. Now if we remember how our permutation tensor works, if we have an even permutation of 1, 2, and 3, that's plus 1. If we have an odd permutation of 1, 2, and 3, that will be a minus 1. So our first term is plus 1. And our second term is a minus 1 times those respective stress components. And so in this case, we have shown now that sigma 2, 3 is equal to sigma 3, 2. That term is equal to each other. And likewise, sigma 1, 3 will be equal to sigma 3, 1 and sigma what am I missing? Sigma 1, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 1. In other words, 
Under conditions where we have conservation of angular momentum, the stress tensor is symmetric. Well, that kind of begs the questions, are there any cases where the uh, conservation of angular momentum doesn't apply to a three-dimensional body? If you have some sort of magnetic field, <clears throat> electric field, and your body is magnetically coupling with an internal dipole, you can have some uh, extra twisting couple inside the material. And in those cases, then the conservation of angular momentum for that three-dimensional body, in a universal sense, it still applies. But in the conservation of angular momentum for that three-dimensional body, the conservation of angular momentum may not apply. That is a fairly rare occurrence for most classes, at least first courses in the theory of elasticity, to have to worry about non-symmetric stress tensors. In our class, we're going to stick to the fact here that the stress tensor will be symmetric for us. If you work in magnetic materials, internally coupling materials, just be careful. You may have situations where for that particular application the stress tensor may not be symmetric. But if you're working in that area you're probably familiar with that already. So this is kind of an interesting result that pops out of this. So then there are various ways to show that the stress tensor is symmetric. We can say that it's equal to its transpose in the coordinate free approach. We can say that the stress tensor components sigma i j are equal to the stress tensor components sigma j i. Or we can write the tensor oops, a diagonal component here, sigma 1 1 sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, and we can also write sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 2, sigma 2, 3, and then sigma 1, 3, uh, sigma 2, 3, and sigma 3, 3. These corresponding terms uh, being equal to each other. All right, well we've got a little bit of time um, but uh, I think this is probably a good place to break this lecture here. And in the next le lecture, we'll talk about principal stresses and how we get the eigenvalue problem out of uh, the problem for determination of principal stresses.